Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to go ahead and call to order the February 20th, 2018 meeting of the Indian River County Board of County Commissioners. At this time, it's my pleasure to invite Philip Ketrovitz with the Humanists of the Treasure Coast up to the podium here. He will uh, lead us in the invocation. That will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by Dylan Rheingold, the County Attorney. We begin with a moment of silent reflection for our first responders. And while we do our silent reflection, I ask that you also keep in mind the families and victims from the tragedy down in Parkland. So with that, would everyone please rise. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Good morning, Bill. I am um, Philip Katrovich. I represent the humanists of the Treasure Coast. Um, and uh, before we begin the, this commission meeting, I'd like to acknowledge members of the commission and the employees who have taken on the responsibility of service. The citizens of this county deserve the very best, and I think they have it. We've done well in this county. Now you may bow your heads or not, as you choose. Our future, the future of our planet, is dependent on whatever course is taken today and in the decades to ahead. It is important to recognize and serve equally the growing diversity of our, cities, our county residents with favoritism towards none. We come together in a spirit of cooperation and compromise, respect and courtesy, calling upon the rules of civility to guide all. As we look around this room, we are reminded that in our differences lies our strengths. We are black, white, Hispanic, Asian, and Native, Amer Native American. We are spiritually diverse, running the gamut of beliefs. Our, our children reflect who we are, at least until they get to be teenagers. <laughs> uh, we don't all think the same way, but for the most part, we have been able to agree to disagree and work together to find common ground and compromise. But we all agree and know that personal beliefs, regardless of how strongly we hold them, are ours alone. As we gather here together, we are linked by a common humanity our shared heritage and our mutual desire to do what is best for the citizens of Indian River County. During this decade, we are struggling to combat hate and bigotry. We move forward, we remember the difficult decisions of the past. Let us keep moving forward to build on to the legacy of those who came before us. We trust today will be a day of forging an alliance to serve the needs of present generation and next generation of leaders to whom we hand the reins. As Americans, we overcome many challenges, some small but others overwhelming and far-reaching. Our sense of community, of togetherness, reaching out to all who depend on us will carry us through once more. May there be respect for differences and the willingness to look beyond ourselves. Thank you. Thank you for your service, Phil.
I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all very much. Under additions and deletions to the agenda, a couple things. One, um, Commissioner Zork, I believe there's a few people here under public speaking that are related to your items. I assume you'd like to move yours up yes. and follow that. All right, Thank so you. we will move 14E1 to follow 10B3. In addition, the county attorney has provided some additional backup for item 8J. And that should be on the uh, dais in, in front of everyone. And I would like to add a brief presentation as 5E on the Keep Indian River uh, Beautiful. And commissioners, are there any other additions or deletions to the agenda? Move approval is amended. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Flesher, second from Commissioner Zork. All in favor signify with aye. Aye. Any opposed? That carries 5-0. We move on to proclamations and presentations. <coughs> First, and it will be my honor to present this, that we have a presentation of a proclamation honoring Larry Staley on his retirement from Indian River County Board of County Commissioners, Department of General Services, Recreation Division, with 37 years of service. Larry, come on up. Let me uh, read this proclamation and then we'd love to hear a few words from you, okay? Okay. This is a proclamation honoring Larry Staley on his retirement from Indian River County Board of County Commissioners, Department of General Services, Recreation Division. Whereas Larry Staley has announced his retirement from the Recreation Department and Indian River County Board of County Commissioners effective February 28, 2018, and whereas Larry Staley began his career with Indian River County on October 12, 1981 in the Parks Division, and on September 30, 1988, he was promoted to Recreation Coordinator and promoted on April 21, 2006 to Recreation Facilities Manager and served in this capacity until his retirement. And whereas Larry Staley has served this county and the public with distinction and selflessness. During his 37 years of service, he was dedicated and his work was greatly appreciated by his employer, citizens, and coworkers alike. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the Board applauds the tremendous efforts of Larry Staley on behalf of this county and the board wishes to express their appreciation for his dedication and the exemplary service he has given to Indian River County for the last 37 years. And be it further proclaimed that the Board of County Commissioners and staff extend heartfelt wishes for success in your future endeavors. Acknowledged this 20th day of February, 2018, <laughs> signed by me, Peter D. O'Brien, as chairman of the Board of County Commissioners. Larry, 37 years, what a tremendous career. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> coach doesn't need a coach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, first of all, I'd like to give thanks to God being the uh, center of my life. Um, I have my mother here. Give thanks to All her. Right, Mom. <laughs> um, and most of all to the <coughs> community at large, uh, commissioners, thank you all. Um, you said it best. I can't say it in, in, in anything more than that. Uh, for the years that I served, I did it with all heart. And I always remember one thing my dad always said. He said, if you want to stay there long, you learn to enjoy it. 
So I, I made that my, my, uh, <clears throat> my choice to enjoy what I do. And over the years, it, it wasn't always easy, but I made the best out of it. And I tried to uh, <coughs> order my steps according to the wishes that, that I saw and the need that I saw in the community. I tried to uh, pattern myself as a role model to the youth of this community. You know, and so I say, if I, I live the light, I can share the light, I can carry the light, and someone will take that same torch and follow me. And so I just commend the community for allowing me to be the person of choice to run the facility, to run that community in parks and recreation. Uh, it's, it's, it's been an overwhelming joy for me. And uh, I can stay here all day and say the wonderful <laughs> things. And I can add some bad things, but I know I'm on it. <laughs> but uh, that's, that's for another day. But um, thank you all. <clears throat> I mean it from the bottom of my heart. Uh, and I look over my shoulders and I see some of my county workers, the finance department, Rianne, thank you. Uh, <coughs> I see Ed in here. I see a lot of my friends, the clocks. You know, and I'm not going to name everybody because I mess up. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so but those of you that I don't recognize my name, you're in my heart. I see the community <coughs> that came out and supported me. Thank you all. You know, Pastor Ryan and my pastor, Reverend Richardson. You know, I, I thank you guys. Um, Yes, sir. God bless you. <laughs> oh, yeah, I forgot about my buddy, Jason. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Larry, why don't you and your mom come up here on the dice and we'll, we'll get a picture here with you. Bring mom up. Come on. Well, this old will tie me up. No, no. I bet Larry. No, bro. No, you are a That's okay. I'm very proud of that, I'm sure. Larry, thank you very much for everything. That's your ticket to get out of jail. <laughs> <laughs> you got it? I'll hold it. Yeah, this is the most press we've had in a long time. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah, I have some. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Just, just, you know, there's, there's so much to say about Larry and how grateful we are and how much we're going to miss him, but I, I just want to tell a quick story that I think sums it all up. About five years ago, uh, we were gathering in the uh, uh, North County Aquatic Center meeting hall before Special Olympics. It was 6 a.m., and we had a, a young student employee who had uh, uh, shown up not expecting a 16-hour day and not expecting to start work at five minutes to 6 a.m., and they were pouting about it and uh, just had the look of fear and disgust on their face. And, and, and Larry just sat down in front of him, looked him in the eye, and went, <laughs> <laughs> and that's all that was said. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, that, and that just... You know, it's what it takes, and that, and that was his mantra. And um, 
you know, that moment showed me what Larry was all about. He, he was a presence you know, beyond his words and um, just an inspiration to all. So without further ado, I want to congratulate him. Very good. Commissioner Fletcher, I think you have yep. a few remarks. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mike just brought up something that it just is only the Larry. Um, you know, he had said uh, just a while back that, uh, you know, if you, if you want to stay somewhere, you enjoy it, you love it, and, and, and it becomes you. And, uh, well, I just have to say that he never treated it as a job. He was known to operate the pool. He was known to operate and make sure those chemicals were right. But it was about human interest. You see, Larry, Larry is a, a, an accomplished uh, martial artist, and he, he became the coach and mentor to so many. And as a collateral, I don't care what Larry did in life, if he wasn't involved with recreation, we would still have to call him coach. Because when he saw someone that needed a little lift or needed a little direction, he applied his gift and he made sure that that person was lifted up to the level that they needed to be lifted to to be successful. And he spent countless hours, other than what he did at the assigned job, uh, working with the community. And uh, I, I only hope that uh, Larry uh, stays like uh, within the area uh, as much as possible because his gift to the community is not done and will be sorely missed in his absence. So, Larry, you're going to stick around a little while? Yes, I will. Help out the future youth? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, just want to say a few words on uh, for Larry because he is a very humble guy. Um, but uh, for 37 years, that's a long time. And um, I'm proud to be able to um, say that I worked alongside Larry for 25 of those years. Um, he's been an awesome um, role model for the youth of the community. Um, he's affectionately known as Coach. Um, there wasn't anybody that came into the park that he didn't um, mentor or, or befriend. Um, but, you know, when you talk about role models, a lot of times you think about the youth. But I will tell you, he was just as a, much of a role model to the adults and to the seniors of, of the community and of Indian River County. And I think that um, the effect that he has had um, all, he, all you have to do is go to one of his Tuesday or Thursday morning Special K classes. And, um, and I know that a lot of them have come today um, to support him um, through today um, on his day um, of being recognized. So uh, we thank them for coming also. So um, Larry, in case you don't know, um, also is an um, avid bowler. And I know that he's uh, looking um, forward to honing those skills in the future too. So um, Larry, we wish you good luck on, on those adventures too. So again, commissioners, thank you for recognizing Larry for 37 years of service. Um, and we look for seeing him around a lot longer. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Jason. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Larry talked a little bit about carrying that light and, and sharing it with all. And uh, it was a bright light out there um, for 37 years. And, and he will be missed. It will, it will not be quite as bright out there. We'll, we'll, we'll carry on and find some good things. But uh, just thanks to Larry. He is infectious, uh, an institution, and, uh, and just a great guy. So thank you for your service, Larry, and, and congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. The rest of the program will be downhill after this now, I guess. <laughs> <coughs> Um, next is a presentation of a proclamation. Well, a presentation of a proclamation honoring Dr. A. Ronald Hudson, and that'll be presented by Commissioner Flesher. And I think we've got a pretty large group here. So, Dr. Hudson, if you'd like to come up to the the podium, and Commissioner Flesher. Dr. I'm going to bring up the uh, contingency. They took the time to be here. Um, again, uh, Dr. Hudson is uh, a humble man, but uh, it, they. Good mom. In any event, um, as we continue to uh, honor uh, pioneer, uh, African American pioneers in any River County, uh, we, we choose to honor Dr. Ronald A. Hudson uh, at the, um, this ceremony. I'm a little, little emotional about it because Dr. Hudson is a very humble and uh, dedicated man, and we've known him for so many years, 
and he keeps his activity at his tender age at the highest degree. And before I read this proclamation, he continues to uh, add. It's not just about a pioneer, what he did so many years ago, but he continues to add as, as we stand with the A. Ronald Hudson uh, um, uh, Award for Student Excellence and Student Achievement and Student Future. And he cares about the citizens, the future citizens, and he watches the, uh, the progress of the youth as they enter into their collegiate years, as they leave, college, leave high school and enter into the college years. He, he tracks them because he wants them to be successful. And uh, I'm, I'm quite taken back. You're a role model, we heard earlier. You're a role model not only to the youth, but you're a role model to us older youth. And you give us drive <laughs> to want to do something in the future and continue on this legacy. So thank you, Dr. Hudson. With that, I'll read this proclamation, uh, which is as follows. It honors Dr. A. Ronald Hudson. Whereas Dr. A. Ronald Hudson, a 1950 graduate of Gifford High School, exemplifies educational and civic leadership in Indian River County through his life's accomplishments and is being honored as an African-American pioneer. Whereas A. Ronald Hudson served his country as a sergeant in the United States Army until his honorable discharge in 1954. Whereas A. Ronald Hudson went on to earn his Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry from the Hume Cookman College to obtain his master's degree in chemistry from Tuskegee University and master's degree in educational supervision administration from Stetson University, as well as a doctorate in psychology, physiology, psychology, and school administration from Walden University, whereas he led a distinguished career educating the youth in Indian River <laughs> County for 31 years, from 1957 to 1988. And whereas A. Ronald Hudson, with the love and support of his wife, Jackie, and three children, Dr. Ron Rhonda Hudson, Dr. Vonda Jones Hudson, and A. Ronald Hudson, Jr., became a role model for not only his family, but for any River County community. In his many roles as chairman or member of the board of directors for such entities as the Gifford Youth uh, Activity Center, the Indian River Memorial Hospital, Habitat for Humanity, Job Training Centers Incorporated, Mount Zion AME Church, and Indian River County Community College, Gifford Progressive League, and as a member of the Indian River County Commission Charter Government Committee, the Rotary Club, and the United Way. And whereas, throughout his career, A. Ronald Hudson strived to give back to the community through the founding of the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, providing professional expertise for area <laughs> teachers and authoring many publications to enhance the students and the education uh, and to chronicle black heritage along the Treasure Coast. And whereas A. Ronald Hudson, distinguished life included the honors and awards such as Outstanding Teacher of the Year, Distinguished Educators of the Year, the Distinguished Educators Award, a Commitment to Excellence Award, Any River County People's Award, the Book of Golden Deeds Award, the Dan Richardson Humanitarian Award, and the Alma Lee Loy Service Award. Now, therefore, be proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Any River County, Florida, that this proclamation recognizes the pioneer spirit and the educational and civic contributions made to the Treasure Coast by Dr. A. Ronald Hudson. Duly adopted this 20th day of February 2018, signed by all five of your county commissioners. <coughs> Dr. Hudson. Thank you.
guess I'm supposed to say a few words, is that right, Commissioner? <laughs> First of all, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank the Board of Commissioners. Uh, I feel very humble uh, in accepting uh, this uh, proclamation, but um, I would be remiss and uh, a little guilty if uh, I did not uh, share uh, what's in my heart. And even though I'm deeply appreciative for what you have done here this morning, I believe that uh, there are thousands of people uh, in Indian River County uh, who should share uh, what you have given me this morning. I think about the time uh, about 22 years ago, um, Mr. Dan Richardson, Dr. Bill Nye, and myself approached Indian River County Commission. And I remember very vividly one of the staff members saying that you have presented us with an amazing plan, and that was the plan that we had brought to them uh, of trying to construct Gifford Youth Activities Center. Um, we came to the commission not knowing what they were going to say or do or whatever. But I want you to know that the Indian River County Commissioners and the staff uh, certainly uh, do uh, some of the credit for what you have heard this morning. My name is on the, on the pro proclamation, but the effort of this county commission and thousands of people in Indian River County should share uh, what you heard read this morning because I could not have done any of it. We could not have been as successful as we have been. And I applaud the staff and the board of directors at Gifford Youth Achievement Center for what they have done, but there have been so many people in Indian River County who have made that a success. And I want the Board of County Commissioners to know how much I appreciate what you have done over the past 20 years and what you are still doing. And finally, just let me say that out of all of the tremendous progress that has been made at that facility, and I applaud the staff for what they have done, perhaps one of the greatest satisfactions and fulfillment that I get, beside knowing that uh, these kids are being challenged, uh, we're seeing an increase in graduation, uh, uh, enrollment, but one of the things that I see and I can appreciate perhaps the, the most is that Gifford Youth Achievement Center has broken down racial barriers. It makes me feel real good when I see people from all over our, our county coming uh, to the aquatic center with their children, working together, playing together. That gives me a great deal of satisfaction and fulfillment because I think that is what a civil community should be. And so I ask the Board of County Commissioners to please continue their support for the Gifford Youth Achievement <coughs> Center. We've come a long way, and we've, we've, we have crossed the river. 
but the ocean <laughs> is still in front of us. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you, Dr. Hansen. <laughs> Dr. Hudson, can we get your team up here? Your lovely bride. Just see our heads behind you or something. You know. <laughs> Dr. Hudson? Yes, you, you need to be holding a proclamation. This way they know why we were here. Can we get everybody in? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And speaking of the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, next year. <laughs> proclamation honoring the Gifford Youth Achievement Center for 20 years of dedicated service. Uh, this will also be presented by Commissioner Flesher and we have Freddie Wolfork and Angela Perry here to receive that so welcome come on up. Great segue uh, Dr. Hudson and uh, thank you Mr. Chairman for the honor of president, uh, presenting this proclamation and this proclamation is honoring the, the Gifford Youth Achievement Center Incorporated for 20 years of dedicated service. Whereas the Gifford Youth Achievement Center Incorporated, a 501c3 agency with its primary purpose to enhance the academic achievement of children in Indian River County has been serving the Gifford community and beyond for the last 20 years since it's opened its doors on February 15, 1998. Whereas Mr. Danford K. Richardson, Dr. A. Ronald Hudson, and Dr. William Nye were founders of the Gifford Youth Achievement Center Incorporated with the support of the Progressive Civic League of Gifford, Florida, and the Indy River County Board of County Commissioners and other community leaders. And whereas the Gifford Youth Achievement Center Incorporated has been the catalyst for helping to improve graduation rates in any River County of African American students which had dropped below 30% in 1996 and today is approximately 74%. Whereas Gifford Youth Achievement Center, yeah, I needed that. The Gifford Youth Achievement Center Incorporated provides programs and activities for all ages including children, adults, senior citizens and its, fa its facility which contains classrooms, computer labs and the, a county library branch and an indoor gymnasium. And the Gifford Youth Achievement Center Incorporated has established vital partnerships with many other local organizations who are passionate about supporting the mission which states, with God's guidance, we strive to encourage our children's development of self-esteem, teach character, 
and encourage every individual to reach for his or her ultimate potential. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Board of County Commissioners of Indian River County, Florida, that the Board recognizes the efforts of the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, Incorporated, and over the last 20 years of service in making Indian River County a better place for our children, adults, and seniors. Duly adopted this 20th day of February, 2018, signed by f all five county commissioners. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Fletcher. I'd like to thank the county commissioners for this recognition of 20 years of service that GYAC has provided, not just to the Gifford community, but to Indian River County. Um, I think Dr. Hudson said it all in terms of the impact that GYAC has had and continues to have on this county. And Dr. Hudson, Dr. Nye, and Mr. Dan K. Richardson laid the foundation upon which we stand today. They planted seeds 20 years ago that are bearing fruit now and will continue to bear fruit for generations to come. Um, scripture tells us to not get weary in well-doing, for we will reap in due season if we faint not. So that's what we're doing at GYAC. The fruit we're planting, the seeds we're planting today, we may not see bear fruit in our lifetimes, but we know it's having an impact on the children we serve and the families we serve. So we thank the county commissioners for this recognition. We thank our board. We thank the families that entrust us with the services that we provide to their children. We thank this community for were it not for this community and the residents of this community, our doors wouldn't be open. And without their assistance, we wouldn't be here. So thank you again for this recognition. I'm going to yield the balance of my time <laughs> to Mr. Woolfork. Thank well, you so we, much. We know Freddie can't stand that close to a microphone. <laughs> And not want to say something. Well, so. being a deacon, the deacon in the church never give them a mic. Never <laughs> give them. But I, just, I do want to say a couple of things. Do we realize the community, the county that we live in? Do we realize the great community that we live in? I don't think we realize it sometimes. This is a jewel that we live in. Now, proclamations are great. And it's the way that you present them in the serious sense that you place behind these proclamations. I come in and hear different proclamations. I can hear it coming from your heart. You mean what you say. And people need to hear that, and, and, and organizations need to hear that. It's like this, this, this gentleman stopped this lady at the door uh, when she was coming to this funeral, and she was bringing this bowl of rice. And as she got ready to come in, she can't bring that rice in. She said, yeah, why can't I bring this rice in? She, she said, you let them bring all those flowers up there. So if you wait till a person lay up there and you want to give them all these flowers, all these flowers, it's not going to do any good. But you're giving flowers today to Dr. Hudson, to Larry, to the Gifford Youth Achievement Center, all these other worthy uh, recipients. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It goes a long way. People don't care how much you say you care. They care how much you show you care. And that's what you show as a, as a county commission. And I'm not giving you in a hot air because I don't have in a hot air to gear. I'm serious this morning. Thank you for listening to us way back in 1996 when you made the pr presentation and in 1998 when we opened the doors. Thank you so very much. Thank you for supporting the miracle on 43rd Avenue. Well, thank you. I'd like the staff and the board that are here to join me, past board members, current board members, to join me for the photo here in front, please. Thank you. Freddie, mm -hmm. when, when, I, when I'm, we moved here uh, about 20 somewhat years ago, uh -huh. we saw the, the Gifford Youth Activity, activity then center. activity right. center going up and I said wow that's kind of large for an after-school program I had no idea that it was going to be a life enhancing machine mm -hmm. and thank you and all the staff for making that place a life enhancement machine because you could build a building but you need the energy underneath the building so thank you all for being that energy and making it the place it is Thank you. 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 Yeah, we were on a bike there at the time.
Oh, what's going on? Coach? Dr. Hudson. Wow. And we're going to have to give that to Freddie. Do you want to give that to Freddie? Oh. oh, okay. What's this big object from? Me? I know. Well, anybody behind Larry was not going to be seen. <laughs> we'll just go like that. Oh, no, 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 that's yours. That's yours. Okay, where's your commission? All right, we got it. Make sure well, last week when we had a uh, presentation on the air show, we were able to call in a flyover. I don't know if we can do that again this morning or not, but we'll see. We do have a uh, presentation by Kim Prado, a board member, and Michelle Dion, volunteer coordinator, on the 2018 Vero Beach Air Show. Welcome. Hello. Good morning, you everyone. Don't lean over too much. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, also added to our committee for volunteers and concession is Doug Clock, who's with us today. Come on over here. I'm going to wait just a minute and we'll let the crowd clear. <coughs> Good job. You can. You can pass it on down. <coughs> I have to give one to the clerk at the end as well. Michelle, how are you? Good morning. Good morning, Michelle. Well, one can't deny that Dr. A. Ronald Hudson has affected a lot of people. He brought most of them here today. <laughs> that is a crowd. I want to be like them when I grow up. <laughs> <laughs> we all do. I know. <laughs> well, well, go ahead, Kim. Welcome again. Okay. Um, first, I want to start off by uh, saying thank you for your support that you've given us at the last show and the shows prior to that. Um, we couldn't do it without you guys. I mean, you, you uh, all put it on your website for us, um, which really helped us get the word out there. Um, last, last show, losing a pilot, was very devastating to all of us. Um, and we, as a board, we made that decision to go ahead and move forward because we didn't want to let the community down. Um, I will tell you that the first air show that they came, we were the 21st pick. It's kind of like the draft. You know, everybody presents um, their, in, their offering of the dates, um, and then they go from there. So the first show, we were the 21st. The last show that they were not able to attend, we moved up to um, number 11. This show that they're coming to, April 21st, 22nd, we moved to number three. All right. So Ooh. that's from our community and the strength and support that they have from the community when they come and do their pre-visits um, and then the, the prior show. So us as a board, we're very, very proud of that. Um, <clears throat> the last show, um, as a committee, we decided that we needed 500 volunteers. Um, I'm very proud to say that Michelle brought in 520 volunteers. 
um, with the loss of the pilot, we did still have 500 that showed up and worked the air show between the two days. So that just goes to show you how, how strong our community is. You heard it earlier this morning. We, we feel it all the time. Um, we, right now we're currently with 130 volunteers. Um, again, we need 500, but Michelle has added to that, to her personal goal. She wants to get 700. So we're gonna do everything we can do to help her with that. Um, and I have confidence that she, she's going to do that. Um, she knows everybody in this town, so she's great for that. Um, <laughs> concession, concession booths, uh, they will continue to be uh, staffed by 501c3 organizations. We will continue to um, cut them checks to that 501c3 organization. 10% of gross sales for the food concessions and 8% of the gross sales for the novelty concessions. Um, with that being said, from the prior shows, uh, these 501c3s getting these checks cut to their organizations, as a committee, we decided that since parking has always been such a huge problem, getting people to work the parking lots, um, that they have to provide two volunteers for the parking, two for each day. Um, they can work throughout the uh, day with shifts, however they want to do it. Um, but we do need those two. Since we've given them these funds, we felt that, you know, it's time for them to kind of help us back with that. In addition to that, um, we do have Boy Scout organization that is promising us 75 volunteers for parking. Um, so you take the, the 75 um, plus another 35 to 40 that we're getting from concessions. So I think we nailed the parking this time. Um, we're also going to start charging for parking because there is a huge cost that's involved in getting these parking lots set up between roping them off, um, bringing in the, the cross bridges so that they can, um, we can add additional parking, get through the little ditches and stuff. Um, it's a huge cost. So we have absorbed that cost um, since day one. So with the parking, that is going to help us absorb some of those costs. Um, uh, let's see, talked about that. Um, the, my co-chairs and I, there's, there's actually four of us now. Um, myself, I'm the chair, and then I have Michelle, co-chair for volunteers, and I have Jessica Francis. She's co-chair for concessions, and newly this year is Doug. Um, he's going to kind of be on both sides for us. But we really listened to what the volunteers and the concession workers had to say from the previous shows. Uh, one of them was parking. Parking was a huge problem for them because they had to switch parking passes and everything. So the last show, you guys allowed us to have them park here on site, which was fantastic. Um, the go line helped us shuttle them back and forth, which was another great addition that we did. Um, so in addition to that, we realized that the orientation spot, which was the Sunjet hangar, was very hot um, for their orientations, even though we had them early in the morning, and the sound system. We just couldn't really get a good enough sound system in there where everybody can hear us. Orientation is a requirement for all of them to show up um, before the air show. We do it two Saturdays prior, so that way they come in, they understand where they're supposed to be and what they're supposed to do. So with that being said, we've moved it now to Riverside Theater. So now we'll have a great sound system. It's in air conditioning. Um, and Michelle pointed out earlier that they're not parking in the grass and complaining about um, walking through the grass, especially if it's wet. So the parking over there is, is fantastic as well. Um, <clears throat> the, the go line that was helping us get the volunteers back and forth, um, that I think was probably the, one of the largest additions that we did last, the last show. Um, the, the volunteers really kept talking and talking and talking about how that was a great help to them. Um, Michelle has a list here of the volunteer positions that we're trying to fill. And do you, you want to you shout them out? Um, we need trash collectors, we need water runners, um, ticketing, uh, people directors, baggage checkers, cash handlers, and parking lot attendants, which parking lot attendants, I think we pretty much have that covered. Um, you can go to the Vero Beach Air Show website. The volunteer forms are right there for both concession and volunteer. Um, please, you know, let everybody know that you know, share it on Facebook, um, and get the word out that the show is coming. 
Um, they were here for their pre-visit in November. I don't know if you heard the one jet come by. Um, it was very exciting. And, um, you know, we, we tried to keep it a little hush-hush, but it, we wanted it out there. So um, the last week before he, they arrived, we were like, they're coming, they're coming, they're coming. So um, all is really, really good. And um, we thank you for your continuous support. Um, and thank you for letting us come in today to talk to you and give you an update of how the last show went. So any questions? Well, Kim, as, as chairman, it's my pleasure to volunteer the other four commissioners to help out. So Yay! <laughs> She's got forms. One She's of, got forms. One of the things I get to do as chairman. So, uh, Commissioner Zork. Yes, hi. You mentioned, uh, do you know what the charge for parking will be? And it will be cash only, card swipe. I know Martin County, it's cash only when you go to their show, and some that catches some people off guard and makes the lines back up. We, um, as a board, we have tried to touch on every area that we could on that. It is on the tickets. It is when they're purchasing tickets online. It's a reminder there as well. We also have email blasts that's going out doing um, a third reminder on that. The charge is $10, um, unless you have a VIP pass, then of course that's free. Um, and we do have, we are going to take credit cards in cash because that was something else that, you know, we figured was going to be, oh, I didn't realize I had to pay to park. Right. So you have debit cards or credit cards. So yes, those will be available um, at the parking lots as you're entering in. Okay. They're going to have the swipe machines and stuff there. So, so. Great. Thank you. And I will tell you, this is my fourth show. Um, so it's very time consuming as far as planning. It's 18 months worth of planning. And, you know, people have asked, why don't you just do it every year? Well, this town can't do it every year. <laughs> um, so that's why we do it a year, about a year and a half. The next show um, for 2020, we already have our dates in to ICAST. So we'll be waiting to see which one of those dates that we get. We're hoping we're going to get April again because we think that's going to be the best time to have it. So. Right. And then if people want to volunteer, it's uh, VeroAirShow.com, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. Thank you. And thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, commissioners, we added an item E uh, very briefly. Last week there was a um, um, gathering for the Keep Indian River Beautiful, and the, uh, the Board of, of County Commissioners was awarded this plaque for a certificate of appreciation for our sponsorship and support of the CURB mission to unite our community through environmental responsibility. And my understanding is we had to kind of do some extra guarding of this award. It almost got poached away. Is that correct, <laughs> Commissioner Zork? Uh, I'll uh, <laughs> uh, no, no comment. All right. <laughs> well, it, it, you know, it, it's just that coveted that uh, there was those that wanted to even just hold it. Ah, okay. I would say that. All right. Very good. But it was a lovely event. Yeah. Which minutes? Okay. Moving on. There's no minutes to approve. We do have a couple informational items. We do have a retirement, uh, Tony B. Etter, retiring from the Department of Utility Services with 28 years of service. So, Tony, thank you very much for your service to the county. And that will take us to the consent agenda. Commissioners, does anybody wish to pull an item from consent? I know, Dylan, you want to pull item J. Commissioners, anybody else wish to pull anything? Yes, item uh, 8D. Okay, we have D's item open. D. D is in David. Yep. Anyone else? No. Nope. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to pull a consent agenda item for additional discussion? Okay, seeing none. Move Mr. approval as amended. Thank you. I'll second that. We have a motion from Commissioner Flesher, second by Commissioner O'Brien to accept as amended. All in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 5-0. We will just go in order. So Commissioner Zork, item D, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just looking at the report, um, and there you are, Jeff. Um, I see on the short-term rentals, which if you look at the City of Vero Beach ordinance implementation date of their, I guess it's a 30-day minimum, the effective date of that, it's just surprising to see a decline in the short-term rental revenue tax. And I just want to see if you had any other ideas of why the decline when the market seems to be on the, on the upswing or, or any insight you can give us on the change in number. There's several theories. One is which is that the 
short-term rental market has peaked. I'm not so sure that that's the case, but uh, we know we're not at 100% compliance, but we're going to get there. Uh, our emphasis has been on auditing hotels and uh, the uh, other areas, but we're going to, this next year, we're going to concentrate on short-term rentals and, and um, condos. So um, I think it's just a matter of making sure that we ensure compliance. Okay, and I know uh, when the chairman and I were in Tallahassee a couple weeks ago, the statistic that you came across of the number of registered properties versus the number of licensed properties is a huge disparity, and I forget the actual numbers, but it was a, there's only about 15% appear to be licensed statewide. We may have a little bit better numbers on that or a little worse, I'm not sure. But obviously, I still think there's people that are on the, uh, flying under the radar yes. on that, and, and they, as others, need to come into compliance. Yeah, and we, we feel confident that uh, once we increase our audit on the short-term rental area, that compliance will increase significantly. Okay, great. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Adams. Yes, um, I think that Jeff and his office have done a great job over the past year with bringing um, those revenues in the short-term rental market to the table. I know you've, you've done a lot in yeah. that, that area. I would note that the difference this year over last in short-term rentals is only $761, which is really just <coughs> maybe one house not being available on one weekend, yeah. per se. Mm -hmm. Overall, though, I think what we need to get from this, this report is that Tourism tax revenues are up 23.67% this year over last, which is, is a great thing, and I think it really shows um, what your office has been doing to help collect these revenues as well as what the tourism industry has been doing. It's, it's been a great season so far, and I look forward to seeing next quarter's numbers. So Thank with you, that, I would Adams. move we accept the report. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Adams, second from Commissioner Slory. Is there anyone in the public that wishes to vote on or have comments on the motion? Um, Mr. Yep. Chairman, I'd like to comment further on Commissioner Adams' comments. Um, I want to give credit to my internal auditor, Ed Halsey, for um, what he's doing there. Um, you can see the huge increase in the hotels. Um, that's, <coughs> excuse me, that's not, that does not have direct audit dollars in it, but it's the effect of the audits that we have done is why those entities are now paying. So that's why that plus the tourist season and the weather here has been very good lately, so that's a combination as why the hotels are up. But I do want to <coughs> thank you all for your support and also my internal audit. We need to send a thank you note to the to the groundhog for seeing a shadow again in six <laughs> more weeks of winter up north. So. <laughs> all right, we have the motion. Commissioner Adams, second Commissioner Slurry. All in favor, signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Item J, Dylan. Thank you very much. Uh, in December, this board had approved a uh, reclaimed water agreement with the uh, Johns Island uh, Water Management Inc. over on the island. Um, that agreement called for a requirement that Indian River County obtain a franchise agreement from the town of Indian River Shores. I can say that Vincent Burke, Jason Brown, and myself have been working very hard with the staff over there at the town of Indian River Shores to work out a agreement that is acceptable to the parties. We had put that on the agenda for today. It is also on the agenda this afternoon for three o'clock for the Town of Indian River Shores meeting. Um, yesterday, uh, Bob Atwater came up to me, council member from Town of Indian River Shores, had a very good uh, suggested change, which I have passed out. Uh, yesterday evening, uh, Jason Brown and uh, Vincent Burke had kind of worked on some tweaking that language. Um, and they have spoken with the council member this morning. It's my understanding they're all in agreement with that. I'd be happy to just kind of read what the compromise was and then tee it up for the council member to come forward if he's got any additional questions or comments. Uh, essentially what happens is um, we have, the county will have the right of first refusal to serve anywhere and they, the county will be able to, if they can design the infrastructure improvements within the two year period or within the five years of the effective date of the franchise agreement, and then the additional language is and substantially complete the construction of said infrastructure improvements within five years of permit issuance by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection 
if the county receives a request for service in the area service area five years after the effective date of the franchise <coughs> agreement, then the county shall have the right to serve any portion of the service area so long as the county is able to design the infrastructure improvements necessary for such service within two years of receiving such request for service and substantially completes the construction of said infrastructure improvements within five years of the permit issuance by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. I think this addresses the council members uh, issue with regards to not only designing but actually then going out and constructing the, constructing the improvements. Uh, with that, um, I think staff recommends approval of the agreement with the changes presented and certainly the council members here to make any additional comments. Good morning, Bob, welcome. Uh, good morning, the only thing I wanna say is uh, uh, thank you to uh, Dylan and to uh, Jason for addressing this on a very short uh, time frame, and I, I appreciate their efforts. So, thank you. Commissioners, any other questions of staff, or are we happy to move approval as amended? Second. Thank you. We have a motion from Commissioner Solari, second from Commissioner Flesher to accept the franchise agreement as amended. Is there anyone from the audience that wishes to comment on this motion before us? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Bob, thank you for coming this morning. Appreciate it. Thank and thank you to the board on this, and I'll be at the Town of Indian River Shores meeting this afternoon to present the, the changes as well. Thank you, Dylan. We move on now to constitutional items. We have a application for a citizen member to the Value Adjustment Board. I believe we have two. Um, Jeff, are you gonna take this one? Yes. Actually, uh, oh, it, I'm gonna to defer to uh, the county attorney on this as the clerk to the board. I'm responsible for the Value Adjustment Board, but before Dylan uh, explains the details of the process, I wanted to publicly acknowledge the, re the retiring member of the board, Dwayne Weiss, Yes. His faithful and dedicated service has been instrumental in the process, and we sincerely appreciate his time and volunteer, volunteerism on the board. And now I'd like uh, Dylan to go through the process and the, and the details. Thank you. Great. Thank you. As, uh, as the clerk noted, in September of last uh, year, Dwayne Weiss had uh, submitted his resignation as a uh, citizen member of the Value Adjustment Board. Under the statute, the Board of County Commissioners is responsible for appointing someone to fill this vacancy. Uh, the clerk's office has received two applications uh, from two individuals who meet the requirements under the statutes. One is Evan Esposito and the other is Wesley S. Davis. Uh, County Attorney's Office simply recommends that the board consider the two applications that have been presented and decide whether to choose uh, one of these two individuals to serve on the vacant position on the value adjustment board. And uh, with that, I turn it back over to the chair. Thank you, Dylan. Commissioners. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to nominate Wesley Davis for the open position. Second. We have a motion from Commissioner Zork, second from Commissioner Flesher, to appoint Wesley S. Wesley S. Davis. Is there any other nominations? Go ahead and close nominations. Anyone from the public wish to speak on this? Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That carries 5-0. Thank you, Jeff. We move on to public hearings. We have a continuation of a public hearing for a water main extension along 103rd Court. This was continued uh, <coughs> two weeks ago. And this is legislative in nature. And we'll have uh, Mr. Burke go ahead and update us on this. Vinny, good morning, welcome. Thank you, sir. For the record, Vincent Burke, Director of Utility Services. On February 6th, staff brought uh, Resolution 3 to the board. Uh, prior to that meeting, there were some signatures that were uh, delivered to the clerk. Ms. Deirdre Parker had mentioned that uh, some of the folks were not in favor of the project. So the board directed staff to uh, send out a new petition, if you will, an updated uh, petition that had the cost associated with the improvements and to get a, um, a tally. So we're here to, to present uh, the update information. So as of today, this morning, we actually received one more yes vote. So that brings the total yes in favor to five. We have three confirmed no votes, and we have uh, one no response. So right now, as it stands today, we have 55.5% of those folks in favor of the project, 
Although I must note that yesterday, Monday, was a federal holiday. There could be a possibility that something might be in the mail, uh, but we don't know for sure. But uh, as of today, it stands that we only have 55.5% in favor. I did talk to Ms. Deirdre Parker, who reached out to some of the folks who was now in favor of the process. Initially, uh, she was, and then she came to speak on the 6th that she wasn't, but then she got more information and decided to try to move the process forward. So she has reached out to some of the neighbors. Some of those folks have not uh, submitted their information, so we have one uh, non-response from Mr. and Mrs. Green thus far. So staff would recommend at this point, since we do not have the supermajority, the six out of nine in favor of the project, to table the project at this time uh, until some further time that we would then have the uh, requisite number of folks in favor of the project. Any questions of staff at this time? Now I'll go ahead and reopen the public hearing. Is there anyone from the public that wishes to speak <coughs> on this? Being none, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, commissioners? Mr. Chairman? Commissioner Flesher? I uh, fully support staff's recommendation and will make that motion. Um, as uh, it has been uh, the past practice that uh, these applications or intentions for service um, rise and fall or once again rise so I believe the best option for us uh, is to table this item second okay we have a um, motion for staff recommendation alternative one which is to table the project and that was by Commissioner Flesher second by Commissioner Slory is there anyone from the public that wishes to comment on the motion before us Seeing none, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. We now go to public discussion items. We have um, three requests to speak. And then also um, we are going to be moving Commissioner Zork item up to uh, follow right after the three speakers. Our first speaker is uh, Alay Filmalter, I believe, and I hope I didn't um, do that too poorly regarding the Millstone Roadway improvements to 17th Street Southwest good morning if you would give your name and address for the record please I'd like to film Walter um, ladies gentlemen Board of Commissioners thank you for the opportunity and thank you for your time so as you know um, we're here today just to speak a little bit about the um, the 17th Street Southwest uh, improvements. Um, I'm a new home builder with GHO Homes, and um, I thought this morning I'd just tell you why it's so important for me to, if you will, uh, grant me my CO, because I'm supposed to close on Friday. However, we're currently in a rental. We have to move out. Um, I have to be out on Tuesday, of which the new owner of, of the new renter, excuse me, moves in. Uh, right after me, the day after uh, March 1st. And then, so my dilemma is, where do I go? Um, we don't have family in town, so it's probably going to end up um, at some hotel somewhere until this gets resolved. Um, I have to move <coughs> my stuff somewhere. Um, it's very hard. I've called around. It's hard to find storage um, unless you sign under contract for at least uh, three months to six months is really what they want. Um, but So i got to move my stuff somewhere. Um, I also locked in an interest rate at 4%, um, which will expire on March 1st. And as you know, interest rates have ticked higher in the meantime, um, as well as this morning, actually. And uh, so that will expire unless I pay $87 a day to maintain my interest rate. So depending on how long this goes, you can do the math. It, it's going to be a substantial amount. And so that's the dilemma I'm in to. So my question is, I think the thing that mostly that I don't understand is why this road is, is being the reason to not release the COs. Because I feel like as a, as a new home builder, I'm not the one responsible for this road not being completed. However, I feel like I'm the one being hosted. Uh, being held hostage here um, and, and, and not being able to move into my new home. Um, right there back in the third row sits my six-year-old daughter.
So if I could maybe answer or provide a little backup of where we are. When a subdivision comes in, the, the size of Millstone Landing is over 600 units. Um, as those units get built and people come in and they, um, they create impacts on the concurrency on our roadways and, and things like that. So it's very standard that the county has what's called a developer's agreement. And instead of, instead of requiring these traffic improvements from the very first house, which we realize the impacts haven't really occurred yet, there's usually a, a trigger point when so many homes have been built that then that's enough impact to where the, the road improvements need to be done. And in this case, um, back in October of 2016, the developer, Starwood, signed a, an updated developer's agreement and the deadline for that intersection improvement was December 31st of 2017. So they had about a 14 month period where they knew they were coming up on the, the deadline. And the only, I, I will either say either the, the only carrot or the only stick that the county has to make sure the developer does those roadway completions is by withholding COs and the uh, not issuing any more building uh, permits. And so December 31st came, the road had not been constructed, so that's when we put the moratorium in place. Um, I, I will say since then, the, the developer has almost miraculously started doing uh, some work there now, and actually, uh, <coughs> uh, I think we'll hear from our public works director in a minute. Yes. It, it does sound like they're making some very um, good progress on completing the road. And the, the board, is very sensitive to the position that you and, and some others are in. Uh, we realize this is at no fault of yourself that you are kind of being caught in this. Um, we had a special call meeting at the end of January and at that meeting, um, you know, part of where we are with this is there's about 300 existing homes in Millstone where residents are living there that could really utilize that intersection to mm -hmm. safely exit. So we're, we're balancing the needs of the existing homeowners with future homeowners as yourself. But at that special call meeting, we did allow an extension until January 31st for any homes that were queued up for a CO to go through. So we were, we were able to do that. Um, that is an option for the board uh, to do so here today. Um, so we'll see um, after we hear from the other folks and, and <coughs> the public works director and staff, we'll see where we are with that. Um, but just, we do realize that you're, you're getting caught in this and we're not insensitive to that at all. Um, but we're trying to balance the needs of the existing homeowners and the fact that we have these developers agreements and we do need to um, make sure we enforce them. And if we keep giving exemptions and exemptions and exemptions, then we kind of lose the, the, the power of those uh, agreements. But um, we'll go ahead and hear from the other uh, folks right now and then staff, and then we'll see where, where the board goes on this. But thank you very much uh, for coming thank this so morning. Much. And um, we, we are certainly very sensitive to your situation. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. We now have a request to speak from Jeffrey Vaughn regarding Millstone Roadway uh, improvements to 17th Street Southwest. Good morning, your name and address for the record, please, sir. Uh, good morning, my name is Jeffrey Vaughn and my current address is the Comfort Suites Hotel at uh, I-95 and SR-60, which I've been there for my wife and I almost seven weeks. Um, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, my wife of 45 years is also here, her name is Jean. Um, we're here to plead with you today to please release the certificate of occupancy on our new finished home in Millstone Landing South. The building department conducted the final building inspection sometime the first week in February. I'm not sure of the date. Um, someone from DR Horton was supposed to get back to me and they didn't, but uh, they were pretty sure it was the first couple of days of February. So we obviously missed the January 31st deadline that you people had set. Um, while we understand your frustration with the developer of the property concerning the slow pace of road construction, we do not understand how you can hold hostage 
would-be homeowner taxpayers from closing and moving into their homes. My wife and I sold our year-round home in Ocean Resorts on North Hutchinson Island five months ago. We have moved four times in the five months. I don't know if any of you have ever tried to find a short-term rental in this area during the high season. Nobody wants to rent that way. Also, many HOAs and condos do not allow for short-term rentals. We found out the hard way. We are now living in the Comfort Suites Hotel, as I said, and uh, we thought we would only be there for maybe a week or two at the most. We are now there for, as I said, almost seven weeks. My wife and I are retired, living on a fixed income. Our rainy day savings fund is now rapidly dwindling. We are literally financially bleeding to death. We have currently spent over $5,000 living at the hotel. Also, there are no cooking facilities where we're living. <clears throat> so we consequently are eating all our meals out, which is also very expensive and really not that healthy for you. So we're a little concerned <laughs> about that. <laughs> Lastly, my wife is now facing her second brain operation in five years. We've been trying to delay this operation for as long as we can, as my wife and I do not want to see her recover in a hotel room, but we were wishing that we could, she could be able to recover in our own home. Uh, it's a shame the only people who are really negatively impacted here are the buyers that put their good faith into signing contracts to purchase and move into their new homes within a reasonable amount of time. We are the people that are being punished, not the developer. Thank you very much. I appreciate your consideration. Thank you. Mr. Vaughn, um, I did speak with your wife, Jean, yes. uh, on the phone. Yes. Um, and she had said that your Horton had told you that your house was ready in middle of January. Apparently, the, our, our, target, uh, our target date was January 12th. That was when their target date for us to close was. And, you know, things happen. Thing, guys don't show up. Contractors, you had Christmas, New Year's. Nobody worked. Um, not that we actually thought that we would be in by then, but they seemed very confident that we would be. So we put our trust in them and said, okay. Uh, you know, it's the, the, the hotel living. I mean, it's nice. They come in and they clean and you got a complimentary breakfast, but um, <laughs> trust me, it's, it's not a home. It's no place. When, right. when we go buy our house and it's finished, it just makes us crazy. Right, and I, I understand that, but I'm just looking at if D.R. Horton had done what they were supposed to do, then you would have been part of the January clearance, so you'd be in your home now. Most likely. Okay. Yep. So a, a lot of your additional stay at the uh, the hotel, I think it sounds like it's D.R. Horton's fault for not getting the house done, and they could have got it CO'd in January. That that, that very well could be. Uh, you know, I. You know, I understand how government works. I worked in government for 35 years on Long Island in New York. Uh, I was very involved in local politics for 30 years on the committee level for the party that I belonged to. And I, and I understand. And I understand the frustration with somebody that thinks they can jerk your chain because they can, being the developer. Um, it's unfortunate. I understand that, that you have things that you can do to motivate him. Although we go by there every day now. And he's made a lot of, they've made a lot of progress on that road. Yeah, they, they have. They've oh yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean that kicked him in the Dude. butt. There's no doubt about it, yep. you know, got him going. But we would just really, really appreciate it if you could do something for us. And I know that there's supposedly five, four other people that are affected in the same way we are. And we would hope that you could take care of them too. The, the lady that spoke before me, I mean, I really felt for her. I know exactly what she's going through. Where are we going to live? Where are we going to go? We can't find anybody that wants to rent for a short term. They all want a, a month, two months, six months, whatever it is. It's, uh, it's, it's a hardship for us. Like I said, we're on a fixed income, and, you know, a lot of this money that we were spending, we wanted to, to put extra things into the house when we moved in, and we're just not going to be able to do it. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, Mr. Vaughn. Thank uh, you. Jason. Miss, Mr. Chairman, just for clarification, um, we have, there are four homes on the list that are, that are ready for CO. I just want to make clear, my understanding is the Vaughn's isn't one of those homes. So if, if the board were to entertain an action like was done last time where the eight were grandfathered, I just want everybody to be cognizant of that, that it's not as we sit here today, ready for CO. Um, the Mrs. 
Phil Motters uh, is, is ready for CEO. Um, the Vaughns and I think the next folks to speak there, we do not have them on the ready for CEO list. So I just want to be clear on that so that the board understands that uh, dynamic. Everything that, that DR Hortons told me is that we were, we were one of the five people that were, were listed as, as ready for a CO. I, I, that's, I mean, that's blowing me away right now. It, 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 it may be close to that point, but we only have four on the, on the list that are, that are approved and final for CO. So I just want to share that, yeah. that sometimes the, the, the story is, is different. Um, but, and, and I wanted to make it clear that, that, that what the board did last time was approve the eight that were ready to go. I want to make sure if they're entertaining a motion like that and thinking that it's going to solve your situation, that particular motion would not solve your situation or but an alternate one speaker. Would. Right, it, which doesn't mean we're not going to get there, but I just want, want to be clear on that. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go to the third speaker, uh, Jennifer and Philip Snyder. Are the Snyders here? If not, um, I assume that they are in the same boat, but as Jason just mentioned, that theirs is not ready for CO. Is that correct? My, my understanding is, is that this first speaker today, that home is ready for CO, but the other two, those homes are not uh, one of the four homes that are ready for CO. As <coughs> uh, could we just ask staff to double check the Vaughn situation because it, you know, from my mind, D.R. Horton had told him back in January, and now they're telling him it's ready now. And if it isn't, um, you know, somebody needs to get a hold of D.R. Horton and shake some sense into him. We we can staff staff can check on that. Yeah, someone just can we check see it if we can now? help shake it loose. Yeah, yeah, I hope they can check it real yeah. quick now while we're still in this discussion. Um, at this point, we'll go ahead and um, Commissioner Zork, why don't you go ahead and start with your item, and okay. then we'll go from there. Great, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, since our last meeting on, that we held on the discussion on 17th Street, there's some new information that I learned about and more information had been clarified and I'd like, just like to touch on some of those points and most of it is included in the backup. So based on this and hearing conversation with some of the home buyers, some of the, the local builders, that the predicament that they are being put in. So one of the things that was clarified is yes, Indian River County does have a public construction bond for $1.875 million to complete the construction of 17th Street. Um, that bond, if the road is not completed as of June, is call, has a June call date. Uh, obviously, we prefer it to be done sooner than later, but it is uh, a insurance policy of sorts that if for some reason it was not completed, there are more than adequate funds to, uh, to complete the construction. Probably the most significant piece of information that I learned through discussions with D.R. Horton is based on the inability to obtain building permits, not so much the CO, but building permits, they suspended a seven-figure payment, well excess in, into the millions of dollars, to Starwood because of breach of the contract of not having buildable home sites. So that stopped. So if we want it, we've hit them in their wallet like we wanted to, to, to teach them a lesson, that's our stick. Um, the builders invoke the clauses in their contract. If it's not a buildable home site, they are not required to purchase, so they have suspended those payments to Starwood. Um, if we do move forward with a release of certificate of occupancies, that does not change the suspension of the payments back to Starwood as, as it was explained to me. Um, that that will remain in effect until the road's completed and they can be issued new building permits and at that time their agreements and whatever they have to hash out in between for the delays uh, would take place. But the suspension of payments, and that's just one that I know of from, from Starward. We do have a, uh, a new representative here from Lennar. I don't know the particulars of their takedown agreement, but I would think all the builders are not forwarding any funds to Starwood at this time until they can get new building permits. Um, so in looking at the list that Jason had mentioned, the four, I pulled an alternative list to really get an idea of what's on the horizon. I know there's a closing scheduled for today with one of the, one of the builders, but the the group that's coming forward, so what I did is I had a report that Kathy ran 
and unfortunately I ran one copy, but it's the code number 135 is the drywall inspection. Once the drywall is done, you're down to cabinets, flooring, et cetera. It kind of puts you in that 30 day to completion window. There's 28 homes that have received their drywall inspection over the past, say, 30 to 45 days. So we have another 28 homes in varying stages that will be coming forward from the 20th going on. We have the four today. We have the other, um, these other 28 that are in the, what I call the COQ in the next 30 to 40 days that are going to be quickly um, upon us. Um, the, this discussion did not involve Starwood at all since the last meeting. I've not heard or spoke with any, any of their representative, but I have had conversations with the builders an attorney representing um, a buyer from one of the three builders in Millstone and um, all just looking for a way to to move forward with the release of COs, keep the suspension on new permits uh, in effect. And also one other thing I'd like to add that after our vote today, either way that we, that we task the development review committee to look at how we, what's the language we put in our developer agreements what other language or what other process or procedures or policies may need to be added to clarify how those are to function uh, and see if they have any suggestions um, to make. My motion today would be to allow COs to continue while the completion of 17th Street takes place and to allow, since we have four and we have 28 on the horizon, do you pick a number like we did last time um, or do we just allow them to continue as long as the road work uh, continues to uh, to be completed? And if we'd like to get a, Mr. Fletcher, you have a comment to say, sir? I would like to second with discussion. Okay, great, thank you, sir. Well, what was the oh, that the, was to allow, motion was to allow COs to continue while the completion of construction of 17th Street takes place. My, my second would be stronger if we put a, a date on the, the homes that are completed. In other words, if we said that any, any home that is ready for CO by March 1st, uh, I, I just thought that that would be still holding back something. And as you stated, we are holding back on the permits. So uh, we got their attention but I, want to, I don't want to hold the homeowners in detention. So I, I would prefer to uh, give a, a timeline so that the, the, the builders and the developer have incentive to keep on moving forward. Um, I visited, they are doing uh, the yeoman share of, of work and uh, they're moving forward. I know several of us have uh, taken a look at the site and uh, I would like to know that these fine folks are going to get into their home. Uh, relocation is already having an arduous effect on the family. I know I, when I came here, I, I had to build a makeshift pen for my shepherds because nobody would accept dogs in a rentable, and uh, I wasn't ready for the home, and there was a lot of burden. I had two toddlers at the time, and it is very difficult to do that while you're living in a hotel and eating food other than fast food, which is very costly. So um, I, I, I get what the, the, they're saying, and I don't want to have them punished by this, but by the same token, I think we need to hold the line with the builders and developers. I realize our issue is with the developer, not the builders, but uh, I think we need to hold this fair and, and look at a timeline. I, I would like to see it, uh, if any home is, avail is, is ma made ready, for CO by March 1st that we move forward so we still have the capacity to revisit this once again to hold the line. Thank you. I think we'll just kind of leave that open for discussion okay. now and then I want yeah. to hear from, um, uh, from Rich and any other commissioners. Um, but just along those lines, Stan Bowling, Community Development Director, provided a, a report and there are four homes that are ready for final CO. There are 38, uh, I'll just call them active building permits out there. So they've had some level of inspections and I'm assuming that 28 of those are the drywall inspections that Commissioner Zork uh, referred to. 
And there are eight, and I guess these are building permits that have been issued but haven't called for their first inspections yet, is that? That's correct. Okay, so that's a total of 50 active or, or final ready <coughs> um, building permits out there. So that's kind of the, the scope of the, uh, the situation. Um, if I, Rich Spirica, Public Works Director, I know Rich was out looking at the road this morning. If Rich, if you could update us on where you see progress on the, the roadway, please. Uh, Rich Spirica, Public Works Director. They're moving along. Significant progress has been made since the last week when I was out there. Um, they st actually started a lot of that work prior to the poles being, the infamous FPL poles being pulled. <laughs> Most of the sidewalk was in by the time those poles were pulled, and that's what we were telling them, get, get some of the ancillary stuff done. Um, yes, they're moving forward. The subgrade, they were grading the subgrade this morning for string lining. After that, they'll be able to test it and start putting rock down. So they're moving along. They put extra people on the project yesterday. Uh, last week they only had four people on the project, but now they've got they've doubled that yeah. uh, workforce as they bring in people to get this moving. They're doing a really good job. Uh, my inspectors have been out there, and uh, they're pushing right along. We hope to start putting rock down this week. So significant progress, absolutely. Um, what I'm seeing for their progress, if they continue, that they should make, again, substantial progress by March 6th uh, when the next board meeting is. So I would like to suggest that with along with the four COs that we're talking about today, I would also suggest that we allow COs for up until March 6th. That way I can report back to the board at the next board meeting and as long as they keep moving. Um, you know, I think it's good for the community. And it also still, if they, if they pull off or they don't move forward, we can shut it off again. But, but I think it would benefit the, the people who are ready to move into the houses, the people who are getting ready. And it sounds like we may have five or six more COs that will come up between now and March 6th. So that's my recommendation. Thank you, Rich. Oh, okay. Any questions for Rich? I know uh, I was going to actually counter Commissioner Flesher's with um, March the 13th, the second meeting in March, and they both fall on, on Tuesdays, um, but we can see where the discussion goes, either the 1st, the 6th, or the, or the 13th. Um, one, one concern still out there, and I drove down there Thursday, um, we're gonna be coming up again on this July 1st on the 23rd Street Southwest situation. And when I looked on there Thursday, not a thing had been done down there to begin either. So kind of my concern is we're just gonna end up in this exact same boat uh, four months from now. Now, you know, I, I, I understand that the 23rd Street isn't quite as critical as 17th Street with the light and the, the volume of traffic and such, but it still is in the developer's agreement. And so, uh, and, and I hate, you know, kind of, ping-ponging back and forth with COs on, COs off, and, and, and things like that. So one thing I'd like to see is once the road gets done, if we start issuing permits again, that they come with a big written warning on it that the COs may not be um, given if this you know, project isn't done and that the builder needs to notify the buyer that this is out there. So, um, so folks like we heard from here, don't get broadsided by this, but that there's some type of notification when that building permit is issued that there is a chance that due to the developer's failure to um, complete the work, COs may be withheld, and that way people, you know, will have some heads up that this might be an issue. And um, and the other thing I think is, you know, the it, to me, it, it, I'm very sympathetic to the, the folks we heard from here. But it seems to me that either the developer or the builder should be providing some relief here yes. and not forcing uh, the Vons to use up their entire life savings. Um, you know, it, it seems to me that this goes back to the developer failing to meet their agreement and, and that there should be remedy um, through there. So, um, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm good going with Rich's recommendation that we they'll give us two more weeks and I think Rich 
you were thinking about another two or three weeks and they, yeah. if they keep going at the current pace? If they keep on the current pace, I guesstimate four weeks total. Four weeks. They should be out and done. That, that's my guess right now. If they continue at the pace they're going. Uh, they're actually starting that's out better. on 27th Avenue today or tomorrow to finish up the sidewalk, the handicap ramps, and then they can get the uh, dirt work done on 27th and get ready for paving out there also. So I would say four weeks, we should be there if they keep at the pace they're going right now. And then just, I, just, I guess a question for Jason or, or Dylan. Um, are we are we setting ourselves up, you know, if this comes up again where, hey, you guys kept giving exemptions and or do we lose the authority we have with this? Because I don't know if the Development Review Committee will have time to come up with a, uh, uh, maybe another recommendation before we get to July 1st, but um, do we think our developers' agreements will still be enforceable? I, I'm, I'm concerned about setting the precedent. I, I understand the motion and, and am okay with that, but we do have the concern of all of those other developers' agreements out there and this very developers' agreement because, as, as the chairman said, not a shovel of dirt's been turned on 23rd Street. So come July 1st, going to be in this boat again with this same development and and I understand the frustration of the homeowners um, I share their frustration I agree they they should not be paying for their room in the hotel no uh, th there's a different party that's responsible um, that, that should be paying that um, and 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 so so my concern is about is about setting a precedent there one thing I want to get clarification on is that we would still continue to not issue building permits my recommendation is we do not issue building permits until that project is done. When the last action we took, we, we gave them some, some leeway on the thermoplast. I don't think we should do that as far as issuing new building permits. If we do open up the COs, we can get the COs through, but I think we should hold the line on, on the building permits. Uh, certainly, uh, I'd like to see them take some action on 23rd Street because it, right now it doesn't look like there are good, good odds of them being done on July 1st for that. Um, I, I think the Development Review Committee, if, if, if they're going to look at this, um, perhaps that's a good thing. Uh, I will say my recommendation, because we shouldn't be in this situation, because this is a situation where the developer failed and we have a lot of homeowners paying the price and uh, the county ends up being the bad guy when we didn't do anything wrong here. Let's be clear, the developer failed here. So my recommendation for future uh, developers agreements are going to protect against this. The developers aren't going to like it when it goes through development review. They're going to say, don't punish us for the bad. I get, we, we hear this over and over again. Don't punish us for the, for the crimes of the few. We're good developers. The problem is we have to prepare for days like today. So we need to not have ourselves, county commission, county staff, in this situation again. So the board can make a determination, the Development Review Committee can make a determination. My recommendation will be something that ensures we don't end up in this situation again where the county's getting blamed for the failure of a developer to get their work done. That's a contractually obligated problem for them to take care of uh, so that these folks can get out on the 27th Avenue. Um, so and, I, I'm and okay I'm, with, with, with opening up the COs until March 6th, 6th or whatever, um, but I think we need to hold the line on the construction, and I think we need to voice and make sure all know that if, if they're looking at, a, at uh, maybe a spec home that's already out there um, that's, that's half built, you may want to think about whether you're going to be able to get a CO come July on that home. Buyer beware. Um, and, and I'm fine, you know, pushing it back to the thermoplastic. That's kind of where I was originally, and then Rich kind of talked me into the, the, the paint part of it, but I'm, <laughs> I'm more than happy to go to the, until it's done, thermoplastic, everything. Considering that will be our only, our only stick that we have at that point. We, we were, we were, I was good with waving the thermoplast, uh, which would save a couple weeks when we weren't issuing COs, but it, when it comes to holding only the building permits, I think we just need to hold the line. Uh, particularly in light of the fact that they're showing no progress on 23rd Street. So, Commissioner Zork, would you like to amend your motion to go to March 6th and then also to extend the moratorium on building permits until the thermoplastic is done? I move as amended. 
My second is so amended, sir. Okay. So the motion before us now is to, ex er, I, I guess, extend the window for certificates of occupancy to be issued through March 6, 2018, at which point Rich will update the board on the status of the road project and that no building permits will either be accepted or issued until the 17th Street project is totally completed and that now includes the final layer of thermoplastic paint on the intersection. Hmm. Dylan? If I have a, a clarification point, uh, I, I don't know if it was an important aspect or not, but I remember in the initial motion it was to allow COs to continue to be issued while the road widening is, or the rod, while the road work is being done. Is that still a component of it that they just can't develop or just can't walk off the, the road work in the interim period and the COs be going? They need to still be out there, still be active, and, and, get, and showing progress. And, it, and that will allow that to continue to go through through March 6th. Is that, is that part of the, the motion? I, no. I, I think it should just be that they can go through through March 6th. Because I, I don't want, like the Vons, you know, finding out that, hey, the developer took a day off on the road, so we're not going to give them their CEO. I, I, I just think these people are getting whiplashed enough, and I'd just rather give them a date. Okay, I just want to make sure I clarify that because I heard a couple and different and that's things. that's just where I'm at on it, but if the developer walks off come March 6th, then, then we can turn it off, but I'd hate to on March 3rd tell the Vons, hey, you know, they're, they weren't working today, so we're stopping you. And I, I just, in, I, in, I, I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm good with the chairman's point on that, that it'll be open until the 6th, and if, if nothing is done out there at all, we'll keep it open, and then the repercussions of that will, be, will happen on the 6th and not before then. Uh, um, I'm very comfortable with that. Okay, I just wanted to make sure to clarify that. Thank okay. you. I just so don't want, uh, you know, compassion to be uh, confused with uh, misdirected um, and wanton and, and hazardous compromise. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's, it's the right thing to do, uh, what we've uh, motioned today, and uh, I, I believe that uh, Rich is not going to go anywhere. And as far as, well, he will. He'll be going down South County to take a look at this project on a frequent basis. <laughs> and in addition, uh, I do believe that we have the developer's full attention, undistracted attention. And I, I believe that everyone concerned is on the right plane at the right time. And hopefully, we're on course. So uh, I'm fully confident that what we're about to do today, if, if this passes, that uh, we'll be in the right path. We'll have people in their homes as they intended, but uh, we'll have safe roads too that were, were already part of the developer's agreement. Good, thank you. So I hope the audience is clear on the motion that we're going to allow certificates of occupancy to be issued through March 6th. I think that's an important thing for you folks sitting here. Um, for the Vons, hopefully we'll, we'll get final word on where your house is in this process. Um, Ms. Phil Malter, your CO, um, should be able to be done the next day or two once if the builder gets moving on it, um, and you'll be able to go from there. Is there anyone else from the public that wishes to speak on the motion before us? Good morning. Name and address for the record, please. Uh, Joseph Palin, president of Black Swan Consulting, also the president of the Land Coast Building. Uh, several weeks ago, I spoke very negatively about going forward on this project. Uh, since then, like staff, I support the motion that's on the floor because there's been great progress made out there. And I'm going to call something to your attention. By holding back the permits and the permit applications, you really still have that big stick because uh, if they pull the permit tomorrow, they couldn't get a house ready for CO in less than 100 or 120 days. So you really, if it goes on another month, they got to wait six months before they close another house. So you really still have the big, the big stick out there. But you know, the people that uh, have contracts, I've talked to several of them, I've been out there for several days. Uh, they're being really punished for something they have no control over. The county's not the bad person here, the county's a good person. I'm a developer, I signed maybe over a dozen developers agreements with this county over the past 20 years. Uh, I've always lived up to my obligations. It's been very hard sometimes. We had to spend extra money, put extra people on the project. But we knew what's up, what we had to do, you know, just like it's been stated, it's a contract. The county also has to live up to their obligation, and they always have tried to do that or have done that. So I think we ought to continue 
I, I support the motion to continue with the uh, COs, but to definitely hold back any permits or any applications for permits. I think you've got their attention. And I think that'll do everything you need to get done. That would be my suggestion, and I support that. Thank you very much for letting me speak. Thank you. Is anyone else from the public <coughs> wishes to speak to the motion before us? Rich, did you have any other comments? Are you good? No, sir, I'm good. Okay, thank you. Commissioners, any other discussion? I have one question for Rich after we take the vote. Okay. So don't go too far. Okay. Um, hearing no discussion, so we have a motion from Commissioner Zork, seconded by Commissioner Flesher, to allow certificates of occupancy to go through through March 6, 2018, regardless of activity on the on the road, and that there will be no acceptance or issuance of building permits until the final thermoplastic uh, paint is put down on 17th Street Southwest and 27th Avenue. And everyone's good and clear on the motion. With that, all in favor signify with aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Thank you folks uh, for coming and speaking. And the Vons, um, Actually, Stan, can you get their contact information and, and, and follow up with them? Okay, so speak with Stan and we'll find out where your house is. Can I say one more thing? Yes, sir. Thank you all very much. You've restored my faith in government, which the last few years has been a little shaky. Thank you. Thank, <laughs> Thank you very you. much. We okay. are going to go ahead. And oh, Mr. Take, Chairman, oh, 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 just so like yeah, I forgot, Commissioner Zorro. Um, did, did, is there a right of way permit issued for 23rd Street? Is there any? Is that like, is it ready to go stick a shovel in the ground for those improvements or, or do they not have a right of way permit for 23rd? We issued a right of way permit for that project back on, I think it was August of 2016. Okay, so, so that's ready to go. <laughs> it's ready and to then, rock and roll. And then lastly, a weekend report. Um, I was out there on Saturday morning and they had six to eight pieces of equipment working and about 11 ground personnel. So maybe on the weekends they're shifting even more people there, but I'm glad to hear that they've got more on the Monday through Friday crew. A lot of that was sod work. They had a lot. They had the sod contractor out there putting sod down, mostly grading That's and sod work. Okay. And Commissioner Zork, I know there's no FPNL poles on 23rd Street, so they can't use That's that good. excuse. Yep. I'm hoping yeah, they take the whole crew. There's any hurricanes lined up in the next four months either. So. And the suggestion to the developers committee, and I don't know how this would play in, but I know the natural disaster that took place of of the multiple hurricanes played some role in the big picture and I don't know if we either put such a long back end date on developers agreements or do you put a more realistic date with a caveat that if you have something that somebody is a timekeeper and you add just like rain delays on a construction job if you have X number of days poor planning and not an act of God is what got us to this point and I don't think I mean we need to ham I don't think we need to hamstring the development review committee with different types of caveats. I think they need to go through it, figure out a situation where we're holding accountable those that need to be held accountable and bring something back and then we can discuss it. Okay. Thank you. And with yes. that, we'll take a break until 11 o'clock. what time is it? We will call the meeting back to order. That concludes public items. There's no <coughs> county administrator matters. Under departmental matters, we have item E, Office of Management and Budget, the 2018-2019 budget workshop and hearing schedule. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, commissioners. For the record, Michael Smykowski, budget director. Uh, I'm here today, uh, we have proposed dates for the scheduled budget workshops this year, as well as the uh, two public hearings that are required pursuant to Florida statute uh, prior to, that are conducted prior to adoption of the, your FY19 budget. Uh, the proposed scheduled workshop dates are Wednesday, July 11th, and then uh, Thursday, July 12th on an as-needed need, basis. Um, for contingency purposes. 
The public hearings, the tentative hearing is scheduled or proposed to be scheduled on Wednesday, September 12th at 5.01 p.m. Pursuant to statute, they do have to start after five. And then the final hearing would be one week later on Wednesday, September 19th, 2018, again at 5.01 p.m. Um, there is uh, one caveat. Uh, the school board ultimately has the, the first uh, choice in selection of dates. Um, we haven't had an issue in the past with conflict, but we will monitor that. And, uh, but we do want to get these on the calendar at this point to establish uh, at least encumber your calendars for those, uh, both the workshop dates as well as the <coughs> public hearings. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Slory. In my nine years here, I think this is the best set of budget workshop and budget hearing dates I've seen. Wow. And given that, I'd be just very happy to make the motion to approve these dates, understanding the tentative nature of the budget hearings given the school board. Check. Thank you very much, Commissioner Slory, and second by Commissioner Flesher. Any comment? Hearing none, all in favor six five with aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion carries. Five zero. Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, Michael. We now go to um, commissioners' matters, and we have an update on Florida's Constitution Revision Commission, and that will be given by Commissioner Bob Slory, our vice chairman. Thank you very much. Mr. Slory, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to keep this brief. Just the first of what will probably be monthly updates from now through next November on the workings of the Constitutional Revision Commission, which for those who aren't too familiar with it, meets every 20 years and comes up with proposals which will be on the ballot next November. One of the, the proposals that was made was Proposal 95, and this proposal would incredibly restrict home rule. Anything that basically dealt with commerce, trade, business would be pre preempted by the state if this passed, and it would basically limit meaningful activities of the Board of County Commissioners to ribbon cuttings. Fortunately, that didn't pass out of the local government committee, though there is a way to resurrect dead proposals, and that would require a vote of the majority of people sitting at the full commission meeting during the week of March. So hopefully this, but, and the, the proposal did indicate that he'd try to bring it back, and I'm hoping that he just realizes that the proposal is dead and should stay dead. Proposal 72 is a living proposal, and this would require a two-thirds vote of each house of the legislature in order to raise a tax or a fee. And I think that this is a very problematic proposal, especially the fee portion, but the tax or fee. The one thing that the legislature has to do each year, according to the Constitution, is pass a budget and I actually think that a, that budget's passing ought to be able to done, be done by the majority of sitting legislators at that time and not be bound by this constitutional amendment or any other legislature. It would, in effect, allow a minority group of any legislature to hold the budget hostage. And I just think that that's bad governance. Uh, so hopefully, I'm, I'm hoping that that one doesn't make it through the group of 37 that will be, we'll be talking about in March and that that will wither away before it gets on the ballot. Proposal 54. Oh, Mr. Chairman, can we uh, back on 72? Sure. But there's no vote required for them to cost shift an unfunded mandate down to us. They can just do those all day long. Absolutely. And that will happen more, more and more often. I mean, if you, if, if it, the, the tighter the state get budget gets, the more they'll push down to local government. And we did have a, actually I had a proposal which would make unfunded mandates more difficult. And as I mentioned once before, that dropped like a stone from a high building. And, uh, <laughs> proposal 54, uh, re removing the requirement of a certificate of need. I wasn't even aware of this proposal until the public hearing in Fort Lauderdale about a week and a half ago. And interestingly, person after person involved with hospice came forward and said, remove hospice from this provision. But my, my initial thoughts on this proposal is that it's not something that ought to be a constitutional provision. It's probably something best up to the legislature. I will see if the board just wants to take, ask John King to have 
because we have certificates of need for the ambulances and stuff. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to see if the board wants to have Mr. Brown ask John King to just take a look, look at it to see if the county itself should have a little more of a position on this one way or the other. It's no big big thing at this point, but I'm, and I'm hoping that it doesn't move forward, but we will see. I think, Jason, we can just do that with consensus sure. that ask John to look into it. Okay. Thanks. And uh, also, Mr. Chairman, one question that uh, Commissioner Solari, I think other certificates of need came into play also for like the Duke Heart Center. Didn't they have to get a certificate yeah, they, of they need? Would, hospitals, emergency rooms, most medical things. Medical transport. All uh, it, it, institutions of people treating people with intellectual disabilities, the languages in there. So basically many, many things dealing in the medical field, both physical and mental. Okay. And my understanding is certificates are need, need, need are there because the medical field is sort of difficult to understand. It's not exactly your free market poster board, given all the government regulations. And that is the certificate of need is meant to make sure that there aren't too many of each type of institution so that they all fail. Right. And you know, the, without a, and the CRC hasn't had a big discussion of that. And again, I think that's the type of thing that is probably more appropriate from the legislature than in our foundation document. But I'll keep the board appraised of that if it does move forward. Proposal 10 is interesting. It's civic li literacy. And it basically just says that in schools, there'll be civics requirements in order to prepare the students to exercise their rights and responsibilities as citizens of constitutional democracy. Interestingly, most of what you would place in constitutionally required civics courses is already in Florida state statutes. So this is more something to just enshrine it in the Constitution. I'm of two minds of this right now. One is when I'm at a public hearing and, and someone says, ah, the, the separation of church and state is in the Declaration of Independence. I'm like going, wow, we need a lot more civics <laughs> because a, a, a lot of this stuff just is, is just bad information. But then on the other hand, the statute says that the legislature's going to provide by law for the promotion of civic literacy and the legislature is not the body which I would actually want directing the civics education of my children. So, <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, difficult at best, but we'll, we'll, we'll see where that moves. Now, the, the next pr proposal, Proposal 6, is actually one that I co-sponsored, but the problem of that is, and I'm gonna read it, and let anybody hear or, except for Dylan, because he's aware of it already, uh, tell me, or from the audience, this is like the audience challenge. If I had a $64,000 question, mm. I would read this and, and say, okay, what does it refer to? Judicial interpretation of statute. Oh, Susan, you were at the Terrestrial Coast Regional Planning Council, so you're excluded now. Uh, judicial interpretation of statute and rules. In interpreting a state statute or rule, a state court or an administrative law judge may not defer to an administrative agency's interpretation of such statute or rule and must instead interpret such statute or rule de novo. Everybody clear on that? Crystal. Yes, not, not really. Yeah, but all right. From the beginning. Okay, so Mr. Pallon, you, you like to come up and speak on things all the time. Yes. Any, any comment on this one? Never met a microphone I didn't like. Uh, that was clear <laughs> as mud. Yeah, sit down. <laughs> <coughs> now, the, the, this refers to the Chevron deference. And that, but that's also the fact that nobody knows what, it, what this means gives the, makes this proposal somewhat problematic because 99.9% .9 of the people going to polls isn't, aren't gonna know what this means and it's gonna be difficult to educate them. For those of us who know, some of us believe that this, is, this is, deals with the administrative state which many of us believe is the greatest threat to American democracy today, but it'll be hard to convey that the emotion that we hold for this to the citizens of the state of Florida. Basically, it says that if, some, if a legislature passes pass something where some of its intent is implied, that the agency which is meant to develop the rules and enforce the legislature is able to make up additional rules and these, the, or the, interpret the rules in different ways, 
and these interpretations will not be overturned by a judge if it comes to a court. So basically the judge is supposed to give deference to the agency's interpretation, which gives the agency incredible power because now the agency is making the rules, interpreting what the rules mean, enforcing the rules, and often an administrative law judge is then finding whether the legalities have met, been met by the two parties. So there's incredible bias in favor of the agency. In my poster child of this is the Consumer Protection Something Bureau, where just a couple months ago, the director left the bureau and the deputy director self-appointed herself as head of the bureau. And the uh, Trump administration picked their own candidate to be in the bureau and there was a standoff for a couple of weeks and finally the, the Trump appointee rightfully was seated as the director of, the, of it. But just the fact that it, an agency believes that they have that type of extra legal power is, in my view, problematic. So. Runaway freight train. Runaway freight train is right. We're all about, yeah, same thing. <laughs> so I'm hoping, uh, the, the Constitutional Revision Commission does have a good website. I'm hoping that the citizens of Indian River County and the state of Florida will start visiting that website. Just Google Constitution Revision Commission. Easy to find, even for me. And you, hopefully, you'll just look at a couple proposals a day or a, uh, a week, maybe. And going forward, we have a committee week on the week of March 19th and then, I believe, April 16th. We will be finished all of our work, which means we will submit all the constitutional proposals which we recommend to be on the ballot to the Secretary of State on May 10th. And then they will be on the ballot next November. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I conclude this report. Thank you, Commissioner Slurry. And just, there's 37 alive. There are 37 proposals alive right proposals right now. Not counting the vampire and zombie proposals. Correct. And then these, whatever you all vote on will go on the ballot. There's no Supreme Court review. There's no single topic requirement. It's whatever you all write goes on the ballot, is that correct? That's correct, and we, we, will, we go through, we, we have the proposals, they then go through a style and drafting committee, and then they'll come back to us. So what is ag exactly in the proposals now may change or will change some of them. They, there's still an amendment process, but we will, the Constitutional Revision Commission will do all it can to make sure that the language is clear before it gets on the ballot. Okay, any Commissioner Zork? On the last one, who's driving number six? Who, who's the group supporting that since it's heavily weighing, putting more control with the agencies and the... It takes control away from the agencies. Oh, it takes away. It, okay. it takes away the preference. And in the okay. state of Florida, it's, it, the preference is even somewhat stronger than the Supreme Court's Chevron deference. It says that the inter agency's interpretation will be followed unless it is clearly erroneous. So almost anything that the agencies can say is somewhat reasonable will be deferred to. So, and the person, the, the main driver of it is, is Roberto Martinez. He actually worked in a state agency and his experience was that uh, as, as a member of the agency, he liked having the Chevron deference or the state equivalent because it made his life easier, but he understood yeah, that it was bad governance and so he took the opportunity as a CRC commissioner to bring this proposal forward. And it was, our introduction was such that, you know, we were at a CRC, full CRC meeting, and when I read it, I was really excited. I said, oh, this must be the Chevron deference. And then I'm, I walked across the hall to him and I, I said, oh, your proposal is about the Chevron deference, isn't it? Oh, and he was all excited because I actually knew what it meant. Yeah, so that, that, that I thought was thought it was on a spreadsheet. Got you all excited. You know, so, so some things that aren't on spreadsheets, you know, still, you know, cause that bond as, as amazing as that may be. But again, the the problem of it is at the first committee meeting where he was a member, but there's six other members. It was clear that none of the six other members knew what it meant, and yeah, I was, and I, I talked about it <coughs> last week at a, at a meeting with group of smart people 
and nobody knew what it meant. I spoke at the Treasure Coast Regional Planning Council with lots of uh, government officials, and nobody knew what it meant. So again, while it, it may be the best proposal that's coming before us, it's a mighty big hill to climb when, when you just, it, it doesn't resonate with people. Well, yeah, just the, would this be the name it would be listed under on the ballot? I'm not sure how they'll style it on the ballot. It won't be, Is that, called, it won't be called Chevron deference. Okay, good. And, well, but, but I, That's almost a guaranteed no. Totally <laughs> yeah, but there's nothing about that, the rest of it that makes it right. t too knowledgeable or not. And I actually think I might talk to him to try to change the phrase de novo to right. something that might be a little more meaningful to people. Good. Just, just label it, you know, free tax break to everybody and it'll, it'll pass. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'd like to say uh, thank you to Commissioner Solari for bringing this information in a timely fashion to us. I only hope that all the other CRC uh, uh, commission members uh, do the same to their counterparts as I feel that we may be discussing this with our constituents in great lengths as it, it comes forward. So thank you, Commissioner Solari. My pleasure. And if any other board members want any other type of information going forward, I'm, I'm planning on bringing up an update once a month, but I'd be happy to incorporate it, that address with any questions, concerns, or things you might want to hear about. Is there any more public hearings or are they all concluded? Well, we had the second public hearing yesterday in, in Melbourne, mm -hmm. which was well attended and went for about six and a half hours. And there are five more coming up throughout the state. Okay, great. Very good. Thank you, Commissioner Slurry. Um, we already took care of Commissioner Zork's matter, so that concludes the agenda. Is there any final comments for the public good? Seeing none, we stand adjourned.